show that if a1, a2, a3, and so on is a convergent sequence of real numbers that converges to a, then the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of all of these ai from i equals 1 to n all over n is equal to a. Okay, so we're going to split this proof up into three parts. In the first part, we're going to note down some helpful facts that are going to kind of propel us, propel us forward um, and make, make our lives a little bit easier. So helpful facts. And the second part, we're going to simplify or make a rather a series of simplifications that, that make the truth of this statement clearer. So simplify. And then finally, we're going to prove the truth of that statement. Prove the statement. Okay, so let's first leverage what we're given here. What, let's leverage what we're given to be true, and let's use that to motivate what our helpful facts are so that we can use those helpful facts and we can have really, really helpful facts for our simplification in part two here. So one of the first things that we're given to be true is that this sequence, a1, a2, a3, and so on, is convergent. And let's maybe rephrase that using the definition of convergence in a maybe more, more um, helpful way or maybe a, a way that, that we can use and is maybe more useful. So, so we know that if this sequence is convergent, rephrasing based on off the definition of convergence, we know that given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists an n in the positive integers such that the distance, the distance between a and a n, which is a is the, the value to which this sequence converges, which is equal to, because we're in the metric space defined on the real numbers, we can use the following metric. We can use the distance, or excuse me, the absolute value of the difference between a and a n. So we know that this distance, based off the definition of convergence, is strictly less than epsilon for all n is strictly greater than n. So that's nice, and it's going to be nice and useful for us to have it phrased in this way for future purposes when we're doing our simplification process in part two. So the second useful fact is I have this this over n business here, and and I I might think after a while of looking at this problem and and maybe having it roll around in my head for a little bit, a thought that might come across my mind eventually is that the limit, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n, that is the sequence 1 comma 1 half comma 1 third and so on. This, this limit as n goes to infinity is strictly, or excuse me, <laughs> is equal, is equal to zero. That is, this sequence converges to zero. And maybe another way of phrasing this, again, I, maybe it might be helpful to phrase it in a different way so that it's useful in this simplification process, is that, that for any epsilon strictly greater than zero, so for any real number as close to zero as I want it to be, there exists an n in the positive integers such that 1 over n is strictly less than epsilon. Another way of saying this is there exists arbitrarily small rational numbers. Okay, so that's nice. That's nice. And notice, notice I have this absolute value business going on, and I also have a sum, so maybe it might be reasonable to assume, or after, after playing around with this for a while, we might want to have the fact in our back pocket that the absolute value of a plus b is less than or equal to the absolute value of a plus the absolute value of b. And maybe we, we want to have a generalization of this fact. So this fact generalizes to the absolute value of a1 plus a2 plus all the way up to a n for some integer n, that that absolute value is less than or equal to the absolute value of a1 plus the absolute value of a2 plus all the way up to the absolute value of a n. So that's nice, and that's going to be nice to have because we're going to, again we're going to have this absolute value here. And we're going to have a sum. So after playing around with this, we're going to see that we're, this this fact is going to come in handy, and we're going to want to have easy access to it. And another fact with absolute values is the absolute value of a times b is equal to the absolute value of a times the absolute value of b. That's going to be nice. That's going to be nice. And then the fifth the fifth fact the fifth fact that's going to come in handy is if a is strictly greater than b and b is strictly greater than 0, and c is greater than or equal to d, and d is strictly greater than 0, then this implies this implies that a times c is strictly greater than b times d. And if you're wondering why, why this is true, um, don't take my word for it. Check out, um, I have a separate video that I'll link in the description in the top right corner for the proof of this fact. Um, but yeah, these facts are going to be nice to have in our back pocket for, for doing our simplification process in part 2. 
What does it mean when we say the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the sequence xn equals some value x? Well, this is equivalent to saying, this is equivalent to saying, this sign is the same as meaning equivalent. This is equivalent to saying that the sequence x1, x2, x3, and so on converges, converges to x. So, so if we want to show that this limit of this guy right here equals a, then that means that we want to show, that means that we want, we show, we show that the following sequence converges to a, that this sequence, the first term of the sequence, and what's the first term of the sequence? From i equals one, it's the, it's when n is equal to one. So i equals one to one of the ai's over one. And the second term of the sequence is when n is equal to two. The, the second term, i is equal to one to two of ai over two, and so on i is equal to 1 to 3 of the ai over 3, and so on forever and ever. So we sure that show that this sequence converges to a. Now, what does it mean to want to show that this sequence converges to a? Well, if we show that this sequence converges to a, that's the same as saying, that's the same as saying that given, given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, we show that there exists a positive n, a positive integer n, such that the distance, the distance from the nth term of the sequence between the nth term of the sequence and a is strictly less than epsilon when this nth term comes after the capital nth term. So whenever n is strictly greater than n. So this is really nice. We've kind of, we've kind of reworked, we reworked this statement into a little bit more of a malleable, tractable form, something that, something that we can really get our, get our hands on and work with. So if we want to show that given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists an n in the positive integers such that this distance is strictly less than epsilon whenever n is strictly greater than capital N, then let's just take some epsilon strictly greater than zero. So take, take epsilon strictly greater than zero. Let's take some epsilon strictly greater than zero. And this is a general epsilon. So check this out. So take some epsilon strictly greater than zero. We show, we show that there exists an n in the positive integers such that this distance right here, this distance from i equals one to n of these ai's all over n, and a, this distance is strictly less than epsilon. We show that this distance is strictly less than epsilon whenever, whenever n is strictly greater than n. And you might be wondering why I'm, I've just said the same thing. Well, well, sort of, but now I've, I've taken a particular epsilon. And again, this is not a specific epsilon. This is a general epsilon. The only property that we've given this epsilon is that it's strictly greater than zero, which is the only epsilons that we care about. So if I'm able to show for this general epsilon, for this generally, this arbitrarily chosen epsilon, that this that this fact, that this exists, that this n exists such that an n satisfying this property exists, then, then we're done. And again, you might be wondering, well, you, you, you've chosen a specific epsilon, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll respond and say, no, 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 that's, that's not a specific epsilon. This is a epsilon that the only property that we've given this epsilon is it's strictly greater than zero. So therefore, if you can show it for this epsilon, then we've shown it for all epsilon strictly greater than zero, because again, this is, there are no specific properties that we're giving this particular epsilon strictly greater than zero. So now we, we kind of have a more focused goal. So let's clear the board to, to write that goal. So goal show that there exists a positive n, a positive integer, capital N, such that this distance, this distance between this term, the nth term, from i equals one to n of these ai's all over n, and a is strictly less than epsilon. So we wanna show that this distance is strictly less than epsilon for all n strictly greater than capital N. So that's our goal. 
So how do we accomplish this? How do we accomplish this goal? So maybe a way that we might want to proceed from here is let's just try, try some in value and see if it works. Try some in value, but we don't want to just try a random in value. Let's try a specific in value and I'll direct your attention to this helpful fact one that we have in our back pocket here. So check this out. Since I know that this sequence, A1, A2, A3, and so on, it converges. So check this out. It may be a, may be a good candidate in value to try first is the following in value. We know, we know that the distance, that is to say, since we're, we're living in the real numbers, since these AI, the sequence here is in the real num the excuse me, the metric space defined on the real numbers, we know that this distance A minus A in and I'll rewrite it in the following way, and you'll see why I rewrite it this way later. A in minus A, this, this, these two absolute values are the same. That we know that this distance is strictly less than epsilon, or rather, rather, we know that there exists, we know that there exists, and I'll call it an in one in the positive integers, such that, such that, this distance is strictly, or, excuse, or rather, this distance, which is the absolute value of a n minus a, is strictly less than epsilon for all n strictly greater than n1. We know that this n1 exists because, because, as we've talked about for our helpful fact number one, this sequence converges. So, so, let's just try, let's try n1 and see if it works. See if it works. And what I mean by works is if we take n strictly greater than n1, then will this distance be strictly less than epsilon? I think it's helpful to kind of have wishful thinking at this point because we still need to kind of play around with this distance here. So let's just try n1. So if we try n1, that means we're going to take n to be strictly greater than n1. And let's kind of see what happens. In order to see what happens though, in order to see what happens, let's play around with the, what this distance is. So let's go to our sandbox to kind of play around with this distance. So our goal in playing around with this distance is to be able to make use, we want to leverage this property, namely the property that went in, remember we're taking in the index of this, this, this n value to be strictly greater than n1 because we're going to try out this n1 value to see if this distance is strictly less than epsilon. So we want to leverage the fact that the absolute value of a n minus a is strictly less than epsilon. So let's, let's do that. Let's leverage, let's try to squeeze out this, this a n minus a from this distance. Well, we know that since we're living in the metric space to find the real numbers, we can, this distance is the same as, this distance is the same as the absolute value of this sum, a i, I did not write that sum very well, i equals 1 to n all over n, minus, minus a. We know that this distance is this absolute value. And check out what we can do. Well, let's expand out the sum first. That's always nice to do with summations. So this is equal to a1 plus a2 plus and so on, all the way up to a n, all over n minus a. And maybe we want to combine denominator, or excuse me, we want to make a common denominator with this with this a and this fraction here. Because again, our goal, our goal, and you might be seeing what I'm, where I'm going with this because well, you, you might be seeing where I'm going with this because I've, I've kind of hinted that we're, our goal is to squeeze out this a n minus a term so that we can make use of the fact that this absolute value of a n minus a is strictly less than epsilon. So if we make common denominators with this thing, or excuse me, if we make this, this guy have a common denominator with this fraction, then, then we get the following. a1 plus and so on all the way up to a n over n minus a times n over n. But check this out, check this out. a times n is the same as adding n a's together. So this is the same as, this is the same as a1 plus and so on all the way up to a n over n minus a plus a plus and so on all the way up to n amount of a's there's n a's here all over n so check out what i can do here this simplifies to a1 plus and so on all the way to a n over n we can distribute the negative sign and we can make this all under n because we have common denominators so we can distribute this negative sign in and we have minus a minus a and so on all the way up to minus a and again there's n a's here so again remember if our goal is to squeeze this out right here squeeze this thing out so we can we can we can leverage the fact that the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon because again we're taking n to be strictly greater than n1 because we know that the distance between a and a n since this guy's convergent is strictly less than the epsilon that we've talked about previously for all n is strictly greater than n1 so we want to make use of that fact that this distance which is again a minus a n which is also a n minus a it's the same as a n minus a we want to make use of the fact that this distance is less than epsilon so so check out what we have we can do the following because of the commutative property of addition and the associative property of addition we can do the following this this guy is the same as and maybe i'll simplify it over here this is the same as the absolute value of a1 minus a plus or not the absolute so, so again this absolute value is on the outside here and we're gonna handle that in a second a1 minus a plus a2 minus a all the way up to a plus a n minus a because there's n a's and there's n terms in this sequence so that's really nice and we're close because this house, we have a n minus a we have a n minus a but we don't have the absolute value of a n minus a but that's okay because check out what we can do we can make use of helpful fact four and helpful fact three let's use four first check out this we have a product namely the product of one over n in this numerator right here one over n times i'll just say the numerator so check this out this guy is the same as this guy is the same as it's the absolute value of n under <laughs> the absolute value of a one minus a and i'm just gonna abbreviate here all the way up to a n minus a so that's cool, that's cool, but we know that n is always positive, so the absolute value of n is just going to be the same as n no matter what, because n is always a positive number. So therefore, we have that this guy is equal to the absolute value of a1 minus a, plus all the way up to a n minus a, all over n. So that's nice, but check out what we can do, check out what we can do. We know, we know this fact right here. 
helpful fact number three. We know that fact. And look at this. This is really close to that fact. This is really close. We have n terms here. We have a number of terms. And we can say, we can say the following. Remember, if our goal, if our goal is to show that this guy, that this distance right here is strictly less than epsilon, then it's okay to do the following. We, we, our, 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 um, our inequality sign is in the right direction. Uh, since our goal is to show that this is strictly less than epsilon. Our inequality sign is in the right direction, given that our goal is to show that this guy is strictly less than epsilon. Because check what we can do. Since this numerator here, this numerator, I'm going to write over here, this numerator, a1 minus a plus all the way up to a n minus a is less than or equal to the absolute value of a1 minus a plus all the way up to the absolute value of a n minus a by property or helpful fact three that we have in our back pocket. So check this out. Check this out. If I just substitute this, this guy into the numerator of, of this guy, then I'm going to get a new fraction that's greater than or equal to the original fraction because I've subbed into the numerator a value that's greater than or equal to the original value. So check this out. This is an absolute value. This, this guy is this, or excuse me, the following fraction is going to be greater than or equal to this guy, a1 minus a plus absolute value of a2 minus a, or to say absolute value of a1 minus a plus absolute value of a2 minus a plus, and so on, all the way up to absolute value of a n minus a, all over n. So check this out. Now we can leverage the fact that a n minus a for all n strictly greater than n1 is strictly less than epsilon. We can make use of that fact that maybe, maybe we're going to be able to show this distance, this distance, this distance right here is strictly less than epsilon. So maybe we're going to be able to show that. So we don't want to pinpoint the n values. We want to pinpoint the n values that are strictly greater than n1. Well, we know that since n is strictly greater than n1, we know that n, the capital n1 must occur somewhere over here. It must be on one of the, must be the index of one of these terms over here in between this a n and um, a1 because of course n is strictly greater than, than n1. So n1 is n1 index must occur somewhere over here. So we can we can just we can just write it because it must occur somewhere. So we can say the following that this is equal to the absolute value of a1 minus a plus the absolute value of a2 minus a plus and so on plus somewhere along the line we're going to reach an index of n1 minus a plus and so on plus a n minus a. So that's really nice. That's really nice to have. That's really nice to have. It's really nice to have because all of these terms over here, all of these terms are strictly less than epsilon because all of these terms have an index or the, 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 the index of this a n value, this a n value, these, these a n's are indexed with n values strictly greater than n1. So therefore these distances between a are strictly less than epsilon. And how many of the, how many terms are there that have a distance strictly less than epsilon? Well, there's n terms in the total sequence and in one of those terms, um, well, in one of those terms don't necessarily not have a distance strictly less than epsilon, but we don't know whether they have a distance strictly less than epsilon. So we take n, this n minus the first n1 terms, we are unsure whether they have a distance strictly less than epsilon. So therefore, the remaining terms, that is to say n minus n1 terms, have a distance strictly less than epsilon. So we can rewrite this in the following way. We can rewrite this in the following way. Let me clear the board so we, can, we, so we have a little bit more room here. So let's remember where we are so far. We, we've shown that this distance is less than or equal to this guy right here, using absolute value properties and the fact that, that well, we haven't used the fact, helpful fact one yet, but we're almost there. Remember, our goal is to show that this distance is strictly less than epsilon, given that n is strictly greater than n1. And we're, we're kind of being wishful here. We're not sure that this n1 is going to work, but it's helpful to try because we made a lot of progress so far. So we've pinpointed all of the, the terms in this numerator here, such that these absolute values are strictly less than epsilon. Because that is to say, we pinpoint all the terms whose index n is strictly greater than n1. And in fact, we've shown that there's n minus n1 of those terms. So check out what we can do. This, this, all of these terms right here are strictly less than epsilon. All of these terms are strictly less than epsilon. So if we were to substitute epsilon, if we were to substitute epsilon, a term that's strictly greater than each of these terms, n to all of these terms, in, in to, into um, this entire numerator instead of having these terms there. So if for each of these terms we were to substitute epsilon, a term that's strictly greater than each of these terms, then we would get a new numerator and therefore a new fraction that's strictly greater than our original fraction. And again, our, our inequality sign is pointed in the right direction given what our goal is. So it's in the same way if I have, if I have a sum 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, and for all the 3s, I substitute in a number strictly greater than 3, that is to say 4, I get a new number 2 plus 4 plus, plus 4 plus 4, I get a new number that's strictly greater than my original number. So I'm doing the same thing here. I'm just substituting epsilon that's strictly greater, I'm substituting a value into all these, these terms whose index is strictly greater than n1, strictly greater than these original terms. So therefore, I'm going to get a new fraction that's strictly greater than my original fraction. And again, my inequality sign is pointed in the right direction given what our goal is. So therefore, I have the following. The absolute value of a1 minus a plus and so on all the way up to the absolute value of a capital n1 minus a plus and there's n minus n1 of these epsilons so check this out i have n minus n1 epsilons all over n and i'm going to separate this out for future purposes you see why i'm doing this so this is equal to i'm going to separate out this side and this side and check out so this, this what i mean by that is i'm going to do this a1 a1 the absolute value of a1 minus a plus all the way up to the absolute value of a capital n1 minus a all over n plus n minus n1 times epsilon all over n and I'm going to do one more thing here before we move back to our, to our overarching proof so we, can, so we can kind of make even more progress here. And we, 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 we kind of reached a point where we're stuck. And I'll show you why. Because this value right here, we can say that this value, this guy right here, since n minus n1 is, of course, n minus n1 is, of course, less than n. So therefore, this fraction, n minus n1 over n, is strictly less than 1. So if I were to substitute in 1 for this, if I were to substitute in 1 for this fraction, by fact 5, because remember, n minus n1 over n is strictly less than 1, and epsilon is, of course, equal to epsilon. So therefore, we have by fact 5, remember, this works for c's greater than or equal to d. So therefore, we have an epsilon equal to epsilon, and n minus n1 over n is strictly less than 1. If I substitute in 1 for this, I'm going to get a new thing. I'm going to get a new thing. That's strictly less than my original, excuse me, strictly greater than my original. So therefore, I have a1 minus a over, or excuse me, plus all the way up to a capital N1 minus a all over n plus, substituting in 1 here, I get just epsilon. So now let's move back to our original proof and kind of see where we are so far. So after all of our playing around in our sandbox, what ended up happening when we took n to be strictly greater than capital N sub 1, we ended up getting that the fact that the distance between this term, this, the nth term in the sequence, i is equal to 1 to n. Remember, n is strictly greater than n1 for all these ai over n. The distance between this guy, this guy, and a, we got that to be strictly less than the absolute value of a1 minus a plus and so on all the way 
up to the absolute value of a sub n1 minus a over n plus epsilon. So we got close, but it looks like that this n1 might not end up working. It might not end up working, but that's okay because we made a lot of progress. So now what's next on our docket is we have to figure out how we wanted how to deal with this pesky term right here. So let's go back to our sandbox to deal with this and play around with this term to see, we, see, if we, see what we can do with it. So first I'm going to rewrite this term in a little bit more condensed way so that we can kind of see things better, kind of wrap our head around it a little bit better. So, so if I rewrite this in a more condensed way, we can just rewrite this as the sum of the absolute value of ai minus a, where i iterates from i is equal to 1 to n1 all over n. So we want to figure out how to deal with this. And look at this, we have this over n business, so this kind of leads me to kind of gravitate me towards our helpful fact too that we have in our back pocket. Namely, that, that for all epsilon strictly greater than 0, there exists an n in the positive integer such that 1 over n is strictly less than epsilon. And this holds for any positive number strictly greater than epsilon, uh, strictly greater than 0, excuse me, strictly greater than 0. This holds for any positive number strictly greater than 0. Okay, so check this out, check this out. I have the following, how, how, how do we apply that to this? Well, check this out. I know the, the, the following number is strictly greater than 0. This number, epsilon, remember our epsilon way back when, when we, when we first began to form the epsilon that we took to be strictly greater than 0. That epsilon is strictly greater than 0. And this guy is strictly greater than 0. This guy, this numerator here, the sum from i equals 1 to n1 of all these ai's minus a's, ai's minus a's, this guy is certainly strictly greater than 0. This guy is certainly strictly greater than 0 because we're dividing two positive numbers. So, for this guy, for this, for this positive number, by fact 2, then there must exist a big n sub 2 such that, such that, check this out, such that 1 over n sub 2 is strictly less than this guy, epsilon over the sum from i equals 1 to n1 times, or, <laughs> not times, of all of these ai minus a's, absolute, in absolute value. But look at this, look at this. So this is a positive number, I can multiply this to the other side without changing the direction of the inequality. So therefore I have, that this implies, this implies the sum, the sum from i equals 1 to n1 of the absolute value of ai minus a all over n2 is strictly less than that epsilon that we talked about way at the beginning that's strictly greater than 0. So that's really nice. That's really nice. And look at what I can do even further. I know there's a property that states that if a is strictly greater than b, excuse me, yeah, if a is strictly greater than b, which is strictly greater than 0, a and b are positive numbers, then that means that a 1 over a is strictly less than 1 over b. And this generalizes to the following. If I have an n strictly greater than n2, and I have the same, uh, excuse me, that same numerator, then check this out. Check this out. I can say that, that if n is strictly greater than n2, then the, the sum from i equals 1 to n1 of a i minus a in absolute value all over n is strictly less than, by generalizing this property here, is strictly less than the sum from i equals 1 to n1 of all of these terms, from absolute value of ai minus a all over n2, which is of course strictly less than epsilon. So therefore, when n is strictly greater than n2, this guy is strictly less than epsilon. So check this out. Check this out. Leaving our sandbox and going back to our, going back to our overarching proof, we have the following. We know, we know that... For all epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists, or no, namely, not not just for all epsilon strictly greater than zero, then uh, namely for this particular epsilon that we've taken that we've taken to be strictly greater than zero. This for this particular epsilon right here, this particular epsilon, we know that that for particular epsilon there exists there exists an n two in the positive integers, such that one oh, excuse me excuse me by our previous work, the sum from i equals one to n one which is namely this term right here, as we've shown, of the absolute values of ai minus a, all over n2, we know that this is strictly less than epsilon. We know that that's strictly less than epsilon. So check this out. If I take, if I take n to be strictly greater than the maximum, the maximum of n1 and n2, so that is n is both greater than n1 and n is strictly greater than n2. So n is strictly greater than n1 and n is strictly greater than n2. That's worth writing down. n is strictly greater than n1 and, so this implies, and n is strictly greater than n2. So check this out. Check this out. If I were to sub in epsilon for this guy, for this guy, and I take n to be strictly greater than n2, or the max of n1 and n2, check out what I get. Because remember, if I took n to be strictly greater than, the, than, than n1, then I get this inequality. And if I take n to be strictly greater than n2, I get this inequality. So therefore, if I take n to be uh, uh, something greater than the max of both of these, then I'm going to get the following inequality. I'm going to get the following inequality. Check this out. This distance right here is going to be strictly less than epsilon plus epsilon, which is equal to 2 epsilon. Remember, because I'm subbing in for this term, 
an epsilon that's strictly, oh, I'm subbing in for this term, when n, remember, when n is strictly greater than the maximum of n1, comma n2, therefore epsilon is strictly greater than this term. So if I take n to be greater than this maximum, then epsilon is going to be strictly greater than this, uh, this term. So if I sub in a value for this term that's strictly greater than that term, then I'm going to get a new sum that's strictly greater than the original sum. And this, this is of course equal to 2 epsilon, so you might be wondering, well, we, we failed. We didn't show that it's, this distance is strictly less than epsilon. We've shown that it's less than 2 epsilon. But let me show you something that this, this, this is um, easily fixed. And let's go back to our sandbox to show you how this is easily fixed. And we'll, we're pretty much done after that. Notice that we said that there exists an n1 in the positive integers, and the positive integers such that this absolute value of an minus a is strictly less than epsilon. And we, and we, we derive from that, that, that this distance, that this distance from i equals 1 to n of these ai's all over n, the distance between this guy and a is, of course, we, we went on to say that this is less than or equal to the absolute value of ai minus a, or excuse me, a1 minus a plus all the way up to the absolute value of a in 1 minus a plus all the way up to the absolute value of a in minus, excuse me, a in minus a. And of course, we, we figured out that there were n minus n1 of these a's, and this is all over n, by the way. There's n minus n1 of these terms that have a distance away from, uh, away from a, or these terms that have, whose, whose value is strictly less than epsilon. So, so, since we know that this is true, remember, we, we, since we know that this is true, we can say the following. We can say the following. We know that this fact, for all epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists an n in the positive such that this guy holds true for all n strictly greater than n. Well, check this out. We know that this it holds for this epsilon, and we also know that epsilon over two is certainly a positive, positive integer, and it's certainly something that's greater than that is to say, or not a positive integer. It's certainly a positive number, and it's certainly something that's strictly greater than zero. So therefore, there exists an n three. I'll call it n three, such that the absolute value of a n minus a is strictly less than epsilon over two. So therefore, I can rewrite this. I can rewrite this if I take n to be greater. Oh, so excuse me. For all n, for all n strictly greater than n three. So if I take n, take n greater, strictly greater than n sub 3, then check out what I get. I can rewrite this as the absolute value of a1 minus a plus all the way up to the absolute value of a n1 minus a. And remember, there's n minus 1 of these guys that is strictly, if I take n strictly greater than n3, excuse me, now let's, let's rewrite this now if, as n3, excuse me, I should have said this is n1 up here, but down here, this is n3. So if I, since I know that there are n minus n3 terms beyond this term, this n3, third, in this n sub 3 term, I know there's n minus n3 terms whose, whose value is strictly less than epsilon over 2, so there's n minus n3 and of course, this is all over n. And then there's n minus 3 epsilon over 2 terms all over n. All over n. So, so check this out. Check this out. And remember, I know that n minus n3 over n is strictly less than 1. So therefore, remember, as we talked about before in our simplification process, this guy, this whole guy, is strictly less than, this whole guy right here, is strictly less than the absolute value of a1 minus a plus all the way up to the absolute value of a n3 minus a all over n plus epsilon over 2. And I can do the same thing with fact, fact 2. I can do the same thing with fact 2. I know, I know that there exists an n4 by all of our previous work, there exists an n4, by, by, the, same, by the same reason that we used before, <laughs> no pun intended, that, that there exists an n4 such that, such that this guy, so let me, let me say it like this, such that this, I'll, I'll rewrite this, this term right here, I'll rewrite this term like this, the sum from i equals 1 to n3 of all these ai minus a in absolute value, all over n, there exists an n4, again, by the same reason that we used before, <laughs> that is strictly less than epsilon over 2, because epsilon over 2 is just a positive integer, and remember, this, we derived before, that this property holds for any positive integer, epsilon strictly greater, of course, any, it's not any positive integer, any positive number, epsilon strictly greater than 0, so therefore it must hold, it must hold, and, and then we derived that that eventually implied this to be true, this to be true, and that, that, that is that there must exist an n4 such that this holds true for all n strictly greater than n4, and it wasn't exactly this, it was, it was just epsilon for n2, but we can, you can easily convince yourself that this holds true as well, because we just, in epsilon over 2 is just another positive integer, positive number, positive number, so if we take n, if we take n, so going back to our, to our proof, we're, we're pretty, we're almost done, we're almost done with this. Let me clear the board to write our final punchline that if we take if we take n to be strictly greater than the maximum of n3 and n4 that we talked about earlier, then check this out. We have that this distance this distance from i equals one excuse me, from i equals one to n of all these ai the sum over n and a this distance between this guy and a which we can rewrite as which we which, which we've shown that we can rewrite as the sum from i equals 1 to n 3 of all these ai over n plus the sum from n 3 plus 1 so the term coming right after so the index coming right after n 3 so aka all terms all terms with index strictly greater than n 3 all the way up to n of all these ai all over n we've shown we've shown that this guy if n is strictly greater than n4 or then this guy is less than epsilon over 2 this guy is less than epsilon over 2 and we've shown that if n is strictly greater than n3 then this guy this guy is strictly greater then, uh, excuse me, strictly less than epsilon over 2. So check this out. Check this out. If we sub in epsilon over 2 to both of these guys, then we get a new sum that's strictly greater. 
epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, but look at what we just shown. This is equal to epsilon. So therefore, this distance is strictly less than epsilon, because when we sub in epsilon over 2, well, not just because, but this, this is just the final point here, why we, why we were able to make this inequality like this, well, if we sub in a smaller number for both of these, excuse me, if we sub in a larger number for both of these terms, we get a new sum that is strictly greater than our original sum. And of course, these two add up to epsilon. And therefore, we've just shown that this distance is strictly less than epsilon, and we're finally finished.